So today we're going to end up the book of wrap, wrap up the book of Acts. So, um, let's pray and start over. Father, thank you for your great, great love for us. Thank you for your patience with each one of us, Lord, especially me. And that um, you have, songs we've sung, Lord, you have left glory and come down Lord Jesus, to save us, to restore us back to relationship with our great God. Thank you for that, Lord. So today, help us wrap up this story in the book of Acts of how we are to get out and share the gospel with people and the love of Jesus. Teach us, Father, convict us, motivate us, whatever we need today. We thank you. In Christ's name I give praise. Amen. So open up to the book of Acts. If you've been here all summer, or even part of the summer, you know that in, as you leave the room in the back, there are two poster boards. And the title of this series has been Studies in the Book of Acts, and it has Acts 1-8 on it. And here is Acts 1-8, I'll remind you, although you should have it memorized by now. Sorry. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And what does it say at the bottom of those posters? North Tahoe is the remotest part of the earth from Jerusalem. So from the, when this started, I'm going to show you a map in a minute because I'm a map geek of how the gospel has spread. But we are responsible to take the gospel out. And so I want to review the spread of the gospel in the book of Acts. And so if you'd put that first map up, Edie, this map here, look at the green area. The green area is the gospel in the, in the, in the book of the New Testament. Okay, the books of the New Testament. But those are the ministries of Paul primarily. And he started in, he started in, the gospel started in Jerusalem with Peter's preaching, then it went to Samaria, then it went to the Gentiles in, in um, Caesarea. Then Paul comes along, takes the gospel up into Antioch, into Syria, into Asia Minor, and in, in Galatia, to the left there, you see where Turkey is. He took it over to Achaia, which is called Greece today, it was called Greece then too. Eventually he got to Rome as a prisoner. That's the extent of Paul taking the gospel out in the book of Acts. So it's kind of funny because in one of Paul's letters, he does some exaggeration. He says, I have preached the gospel fully in the entire world. And obviously it's hyperbole. And functionally, in Paul's world, the Mediterranean was the primary world at that time. So in Paul's ministry and the other apostles, the gospel has gone to the eastern world of the Mediterranean world. But then as it spread, you can see the second century is the gray area. It's spread out in the second century. Now... Jesus' command was, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses where? Okay, they started there. Next, Judea, which is the, which is the country Jerusalem's in. Samaria, which is the country to the north, to the ends of the earth. Well, that's nowhere near the ends of the earth. We'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. Okay, we'll get back to that in a minute. So, what I want you to do... And that map, by the way, is 30 years after Christ's death, Paul had done that. And, um, and given travel difficulties back then, he has to walk, ride a horse possibly, get on a ship. Um, it's amazing how far the gospel went in 30 years. Absolutely amazing. Now, I want to look at Matthew 28, if you would turn there. In your notes, I say each believer's responsibility is to be part of the disciple-making process. I want to read to you Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and um, I want to read it to you, then I want to show you another map, okay? So go to Matthew 28, 18 and 20. This is called the Great Commission. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's been teaching his disciples. He's ready to ascend to heaven, and he gives his disciples this last command. Chapter 28 of Matthew, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How much? All authority. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I, I, just, I told you before, I just love that word. I have no clue what it means. <laughs> and lo, I am with you always. To the end of the age. 
And so four times it says all. All authority is given to Jesus. Go into all the nations and make disciples. Teach them all that I have commanded you. And I am with you always. And the promise of him being with us always is not just a promise of his presence. It's a promise of success. If we will obey his command, he will be with us to bring about the results he's called us to do. Because often what happens in our heads is, I can't do that. I can't do that. Um, and what we have to say is, you know, no, you can't. You and I, you know, Philippians, we're going to see, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But by myself, I, I, I don't accomplish much, but through Christ. So he's, called, he's given us a commission, and what he calls us to do, he equips us to do. So, so I, I want to expand on that a little bit, but I want to show you now the next map. So this is the map of the whole world. By the time of the end of the second century, you see the circle around the Mediterranean? That's as far as the gospel went. So some people will say, hey, this great commission is spoken to the 11. It's their job. It wasn't our job. So but if that's as far as the 11 got the gospel, and, and, and some people say Thomas, or I forget, Philip or Thomas went to India, and by the end of the second century, it's up into, into to, um, northern Europe. So it's certainly, it's certainly larger than our map is showing. But for the most part, the Mediterranean world is the extent of the apostles' ministry, and even into the second century. If Jesus ta says, take the gospel to all nations, and that's as far as they got, then whose responsibility is it? every generation that comes along after them. And, and the church, in different periods of history, has done a very good job sometimes and has been lackadaisical sometimes. I want to show you this video of the spread of Christianity over the last 2,000 years. And it's fascinating. As you look at it, it, it goes quick. C -c Can you stop it? Sorry. Start it over. If you see on the red left side bottom, you'll see colors showing you Basically, it's the legend for the, what the colors mean. And just look at how Christianity has spread and the other competing worldviews and what it's done to Christianity. This is just a visual to show the history of the church, the spread of Christianity, and actually sometimes the reduction of Christianity. And it's just a good visual to learn. So if we could start that over, Edie, is that possible? Notice now the green is Islam. A thousand years after Christ, it finally gets up into the Scandinavian area. comes to the new world, and that wasn't, wasn't always a pretty thing, as we know. Edie, could you stop it there? You see, Christianity's influence has gone worldwide. Now, because someone claims to be a Christian doesn't mean they are. We know that, right? We all claim things that, that aren't necessarily true of us, so, but I'm not here to judge that. But Christianity has gone out to the world in a very real manner. And you saw how communism affected it. Um, in fact, in, in, in China, China is still primarily not Christian, but there is a vibrant Christian church there. There's a vibrant Christian church in, 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 um, in Russia now. Communism tried to kill it and couldn't. But if you notice the green and then the orange yellow, it's not, um, orange is red there. You see that with Islam and communism now? That's called the 1040 window. Longitude. Or is that latitude, you guys? Help, someone help me. I hear, I hear both people. It's the longitude or latitude? <laughs> latitude, thank you very much. Latitude and you got a good attitude, so. 
that is the 1040 window, meaning this. That is the area where Christianity is almost non-existent. In the green part, the Muslim world, in China, there's a thriving church, but still it's very persecuted. Um, so that's where I wonder if we should put our prayers and energy as we move forward, you know? Um, so, so you have a role in the Great Commission, a role in the Great Commission in Incline Village, Kings Beach, Tahoe City, Truckee, wherever you live in, in here, even down in South Shore. But we also have a role worldwide, that we have a responsibility as believers in Jesus Christ, living in 2019, to be concerned about the gospel going to the ends of the earth. Um, so, so with that, I want to sh give you a thought. Why should we do this? Why should we do this? Why should we care? And any Presbyterians in the room? Okay, we have four. The first question in the Westminster Catechism, which is the Presbyterian um, um, Catechism, is this. What, the first question you would ask a child, what is the chief end of mankind? And the answer is, you shall glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Okay, so this is what you would teach your children. What is your purpose on earth? Why are you here? What is the chief end of your existence? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's beautiful. Then we ask, well, so I say in your notes, there's, a, there's this fill in the blank today, look in your notes. The ultimate motivation for all we do must be the glory of God alone. All right? The ultimate motivation. Then under that ultimate motivation, there's many other motivations. But let's talk about the ultimate motivation if everything we do in life needs to be God. Today, I wake up, and, and if I was this disciplined before I get out of bed, I would say, God, Today I want everything I do to glorify you. So that when I put my head on this pillow tonight, I can say, God, I hope I honored you today in everything I did. And then to enjoy him forever means it's a relationship. This isn't a, an impersonal God who's waiting to smack you in the next week when you misbehave. This is a personal God who loves you and sent his son to die for you, who has redeemed you given you a new life, the power of the Holy Spirit, and said, now I've given you a phenomenal purpose. Live your life every day to glorify me. So how do we put teeth to that? How do we put teeth to that? I want to give you a picture here of the body of Christ. Everyone understand the term the body of Christ? The body of Christ is a metaphor, but it, it's, it's, it's got a life of its own. If, if we're a body, we're one body. If you believe in Jesus, you belong to the body of Christ. And who's the head? Jesus is the head. So the head directs the body. So we are one. We are one. And this is just 300 Country Club Drive. We have other churches in this town, in this community, and, and in this state and city. And, and all through. There's one body of Christ. Everyone who believes in Jesus belongs to the one church. And we just happen to meet at 300 Country Club Drive. But we all have been gifted and designed to function in this body. So, so we have Micah over there playing guitar. And, and Micah has certain gifts from the Spirit of God to give to him. And he has certain talents. He has musical ability. He has certain, certain interests in life, a certain personality. So God, I, I didn't tell you I was going to pick on you, Micah. But God has wired Micah differently than others of you. Jason over there is wired differently than Micah. Actually, they're pretty similar if they get to talking to each other. So how do you guys carry out the Great Commission? Well, we've got to be careful of when I say you need to get out and be witnesses for Jesus. We have to be very careful. We just don't have this cooker, cut, cooker cookie cutter. I'll tell you guys, it's been a weird week. <laughs> a cookie cutter thing where we're all the same. Now, everyone go out and knock on someone's door and tell them about Jesus. Everyone go out and stand on the corner and hand out tracts. Everyone go down, you know. No, that's not how it works. Some of you were designed for that. Some of you were designed to be prayer warriors and be in your closet praying for people to come to faith. Some of you were designed to work with children to tell them about Jesus. Some of you were designed more to work with the believer and help them to grow 
to make disciples. Remember, the commission is to make disciples, not simply evangelism. Do you hear the difference? It's very important. If you talk to an evangelist, you say, what's the purpose of the church? They would say evangelism. That's not what Jesus said. The purpose of the church is to make disciples. Making a disciple is taking someone from unbelief to maturity in Christ. Do you follow me? This is very important. Okay, I didn't see a lot of head shaking. Okay, we have one yes, so I assume everyone agrees with you. Um, from unbelief to maturity in Christ, it's a lifelong process. The body of Christ is involved in every step along the way, and you are designed differently to have a role in somewhere in that process. And the point is, you have to engage how God is designing you. You've got to talk to him about it. You've got to be in community with other believers. Because if, if, if I were to ask you, what's your spiritual gift? About half of you would say, I don't even think I have one. I'd say, you do. Every person has the Holy Spirit in them has a spiritual gift, if not more than one spiritual gift. But you know how you find it? Not through taking a test. That's a good discussion starter, but that, that's not how you find it. You take it by being involved in people's lives. I remember I was a brand new Christian. For about the first two years of my Christian life, I was in a Bible study. And I wasn't a teacher, I was a participant. And I was really burdened for the poor. And so when, when we went around to take this, this, what's your spiritual gift? What's your spiritual gift? What's your spiritual gift? I said, mine's giving. Because so I was really burdened for the poor. I felt guilty for having things. But what we did, before we could say what our gift was, everyone in the Bible said they'd been together for two years, would say, they all, we would go around the room, they would all tell one person, here's how you minister to me. And during that thing, I'm thinking my spiritual gift is giving. So they were all going around the room and they all said, Tony, you have the gift of teacher. I said, what are you talking about? I'm not the teacher here. They said, yeah, but in our discussion, we learn from you. I said, I thought my gift was giving. So I quit giving. <laughs> and I am. Um, totally not true. So, I, you know. Um, but I had I thought of one thing, but they saw in me something else. If you're not in community with people, they can get to know you. You can't fully know how you minister to other people. So that's, that's just a plug to join a small group. Um, so the glory of God is what you live your life for. And in making disciples, you have to figure out how are you wired? How has God wired you and your gifting and your talents and your personality, your experiences? All those things come together to make you. And they say, okay, God, now use me, how you've wired me, to make a disciple or make disciples, whether it's the beginning of the process, telling my neighbor about Jesus, having the boldness of evangelism, um, coming here and serving people in children's ministry, serving in our greeting ministry because your personality is you love to welcome people. All that is a package that will move people forward in the faith. Paul's goal in life, he says in Colossians, he says in, in, in Galatians 4.19, he says, I'm in labor, for you Galatians, he has a childbirth term, I'm in labor until Christ is formed in you. That's Paul's mission. I'm in labor till Christ is formed in you. All of us should have that as our mission. God, you've wired me to help other people grow in Christ. And you've wired other people to help me grow in Christ. So are you with me now in the Great Commission and your role in it? If you have no clue what your role is, you've got to talk to God and get involved in community here in this church so other people can help you see how you're wired. Now, I want you to think, in fact, um, Ken gave me this illustration. It's, it's actually, I found out Ken is the old illustration, but he, he, he gave it to me the other day. Imagine a tandem bicycle, okay, a tandem bicycle. And you're on the front, you're steering, and Jesus is in the back. So Jesus is providing the power with you to go where you want to go. Wrong. Who should be steering the bike? And we're in the back, and we are his servants, pedaling where he is taking us. What I want to do, and this is a short sermon today, don't get used to it. I want us to go to Joshua chapter 24. I had the privilege the last two days to speak at a men's retreat down at the Presbyterian Conference Ground in South Shore at Zephyr, Zephyr Point. A friend of mine is a pastor in, in Reno at the Covenant Presbyterian. He asked me to come speak at his men's retreat. And I taught on Joshua. 
And, and I want to give you a, a little something I did there. Go to Joshua 24. If you know the story of Joshua, Moses was not allowed into the promised land. Moses, in, after 40 years of serving God, he, he made a huge mistake. To me, it seemed kind of petty, but I got to be careful calling God's decisions petty. But God told Moses to speak to the rock and water would come out of the rock to, to give the people of Israel water in the desert. And Moses is so frustrated with the people, he takes his staff, the staff that, that budded, the staff that, you know, flowers came out of, the staff that turned into a snake, the staff that split the Red Sea, the staff that Moses carried around for 40 years. In his frustration, he didn't speak to the rock. He hit the rock twice. Water came out. God gave water to his people. But he told Moses, Moses, because you dishonored me in front of the people, you don't get to go into the promised land. And when you read this story, your heart just sinks. Oh, God, really? I'll bet you a hundred bucks everyone in this room has done way worse sins. Um, at least my perspective of it. Nonetheless, Moses doesn't come in. So Joshua, his servant, takes the people into the land. And Joshua is told in chapter 1, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Because no man will stand before you all the days of your life if you obey me. Be strong and courageous. I am with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. So Joshua leads the people into the promised land. And the whole book of Joshua is about that conquest. Then he gets to the end. And the people still have some idols. The Israelites still have some idols. So Joshua now is confronting them. So I want to use this passage to confront us. Let, let the scriptures confront you. Let the Spirit of God do this. My, my job is to read it to you a little explanation. While we are not Israel, we are not under the old covenant, we are the church, we're under the new covenant. But the principle is the same, I want to suggest to you. The things Joshua is telling the people is the same things that I believe we are to understand how we are to follow Jesus. So we're going to start in Joshua 24, verse 14. So it's the end of Joshua's life. He's grown old. Verse 14, now, therefore, fear the Lord. And I remember the, the word, what is the word behind the Lord? Yahweh. Fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve Yahweh. Serve the Lord. So and I'm not reading the whole section to you, but 12 or 13 times the word serve is here. So as you're reading through this, I want you to think, what does it mean to serve God? We just saw the first word, fear. So, let me see how far I'm going to read. Verse, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. So what, what, what is the immediate application to us? How many of you serve the gods of the Amorites? Or the gods of the Egyptians? So we, we, we're not idol worshipers in the sense that we actually build an idol out of wood or stone or, or gold and put it on our mantle and bow before it. That's what they were doing. We don't do that. But what idols do we serve? I would suggest here's the very first idol most of us serve. Not Tony, ourselves. Um, I'm pretty much am convinced that I'm the top of the food chain, and Jesus should be in the back seat, powering where I want to go. That's idolatry. That's idolatry. So Cornerstone Community Church and visitors today, choose whom you will serve. Is it yourself and your purposes and your mission in life? Or is it the Lord Jesus Christ, who made you into a people for his own possession. Verse 16, the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Yahweh our God is he who brought us, out of the, brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and who did great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed. Yahweh drove out them before us 
excuse me, Yahweh drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve Yahweh. He is our God. And so that's, that's the admission to say we're letting Yahweh drive and we will serve him. So jump now up to verse 23. There's a word here, because it goes on. It goes on the same thing. Serve, serve, serve. So Joshua says again, Now therefore, put away... Before, and I didn't tell you this, Edie, I apologize, but... Yeah, you, Edie's incredible. Now therefore, put away the foreign gods which are in your midst, and look at this, incline your hearts to Yahweh, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God, the Yahweh our God, and we will obey what a great word, imagery. Incline your hearts. So it's that, that picture, and, and, and actually back in 23, I didn't read it to you. Back in 23, before all this started, Joshua says, cling to the Lord. So I want you to think the definition. What does it mean to serve Yahweh? First in 23, he says, cling to the Lord, not to the idols. So it's realizing, okay, I'm not God. I have limited wisdom, limited understanding. My God is the great God. He knows all. He has a plan that's perfect. I don't always understand him, but I'm going to cling to him. I'm going to grab a hold of him and never let go. And that then has developed this idea of serve him. Then he ends that section with incline your heart towards him. So isn't that incredible imagery there? So, so what are some of the things we incline our heart towards? Besides self-idolatry, what, what else do we incline our hearts towards sometimes? Money, mm -hmm. pleasure. We, we are phenomenal hedonists. And, and I, I said that one time, and some of the church objected to it. And I said, I'm not trying to insult anybody. I'm a hedonist. When I wake up in the morning, my first thought really isn't inclining my heart to my God. My first thought is, do I get to go mountain biking today? You know, do I have some opportunity? And I have to fight that. Not, nothing wrong with mountain biking, but where is my heart inclined towards? What am I clinging to? And God gives us all sorts of things to enjoy. So I'm not suggesting any kind of entertainment isn't honorable. But if that's what I live for, then I'm not inclining my heart to Yahweh. I'm not clinging to him. I'm certainly not serving him. So when it comes to the Great Commission, I, am, I want us to wake up tomorrow morning. I want you to start praying this, Lord. What does it mean for me to be one of your servants? I'm here to serve you. One of your servants in the Great Commission. How have you wired me? You've designed me a certain way. You've given me experiences in life. Sometimes tragedy, sometimes great joys. But you've developed who I am in order to use me as your instrument in people's lives. Where can I serve God in the Great Commission so I can help develop Christ in people? Does this make sense? We're not cookie cutters. We are individuals. But individually, we come together as a group called the Body of Christ and we make disciples. So let me tell you something we're doing. Everyone had on this seat today this. Nolan, where's Nolan? Stand up, Nolan. Nolan, Nolan tells me, can I tease you? You might not come back. No one is from Colombian descent. He tells me all Colombians are good looking. Yeah. <laughs> now that is quite humble of him, is it not? <laughs> um, so go ahead and sit down, good looking. Um, no one has come in and met with Daryl and I one day and said, I have these visions and passions to want to organize events to, so people can get to know Jesus. And so he came up with an idea and presented it to Daryl and I. We presented it to the elders. And it turned out it's called Incline Fest. Incline Fest is a day we've invited this community and, and anyone in North Shore to come to our church on October 5th. And we are going to have bounce houses. We are going to have tri-tip barbecued for them here. We are going to have games for all ages. We're going to have a DJ that, that's playing music. The entire parking lot is going to be filled with people from our church and people from the community that are coming here. And the goal, I call this pre-evangelism. The goal of this is to simply get people to see this church is for them. 
If you notice on the screen, on the, on the um, flyer at the very bottom, it says hashtag for North Tahoe. We're going to start developing over the fall this whole campaign called for North Tahoe. This church needs to have in their mind because God has called you his own. He has made you one of his children. He wants you to live for his glory. He has made you in the body of Christ. Now he's asked you to take the gospel out to the world and make disciples. We're going to start in our own community and we're going to do what we do for North Tahoe. So when people drive by this church, they will say, you know what? I always wondered about that church, but I'm hearing things about that church. They seem to care about this community. And over time, we're going to develop a reputation. See, now, I think we have a good reputation for the most part. I've asked people all over the community, the two years I've been here, what do you think of that church? It's usually, hmm, I don't know anything about it, to, oh, they do good things. I've never heard someone say, you guys are stinkers. I've never heard anyone say that. Um, but I want it to where this whole community knows the people that gather at this building are for them. And by doing that, then... We earn the right when God opens that door to say, may I tell you about my Savior? You know, would you come to my church and hear about my Savior? Would you come to my home Bible study? Would you come over to my house for dinner? We'd like to pray for you. However God has wired you. Incline Fest is kind of the first foray out into this process. So here's what we're asking you to do. Get involved in Incline Fest. There, there is a... Um, inclinefest.com go there the food's free but we're trying to see how many people come so far we have how many signed up 140 people have signed up we want you to sign up so we have food enough food to buy for you but we put these on the seat what we want you to do if you will take this and give it to a neighbor to a friend a coworker, and invite them if you don't want to do that then leave it on the chair if you want more, there's a whole stack out there. Grab more. This is a simple way to simply say, you know, my church is going to have some fun. We'd love for you to come. Here, come. Bring your children. This is really geared around families, but us old people are welcome too. I'm going to get my grandkids up here. So you understand what I'm saying? Are you with us on this? Yes. No one has put his heart into this. Let's not disappoint Nolan. Um, and there's, he's got a, he put a, I said, Nolan, if you want to do this, you've got to put a team together. And he's put a team together. Lucas is part of the team. Where's Lucas? Eric Knopf is part of the team. Um, Deborah's part of the team. So we have a whole team we're doing this. Daryl's part of the team. I'm part of the team. And, and our desire now is to get the volunteers to help. So here's the pitch. <laughs> we need people who will come set up the party. We're calling it the, what are we calling it, the pre-party setup team? Something like that. We need people to help tear the party down afterwards. We need people to run the bounce house. We're going to have three bounce houses on this property. We need people to do games for older kids. We need people to, to help do the food. Nolan's dad's coming in. He's, he's, a, he's a, 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 a professional barbecuer. And he's going to come in and barbecue. And feel, we need people to set that up, to serve. There's a place for you in this to bless people and for you to smile and say welcome to our church so there's sign up sheets out there a few people have signed up I hope it's filled today filled today it takes place in two weeks from yesterday October 5th so please please join us as we're trying to get the people of this church to bless the people of our communities so someday we might be able to tell them about our great Savior who has died on the cross for them was buried and rose again to give them a new life Someone say amen. amen. Okay.